Good evening. This is a re-recording of my talk about my book that just came out very recently called Apis Berlin Diaries, My Quest to Understand My Grandfather's Nazi Past. I gave this at the Buchanan Library and I want to thank Meg Paulett for inviting me. I will just put up my PowerPoint and then we are ready to go. I never wanted to write this diary. After my mother's death, I found two little notebooks hidden behind books in her Vienna apartment. I opened them, curious what to see what was in them, and immediately recognized the handwriting of my grandfather. He had written poems for me to recite at Christmas and other special occasions, and I had spent the happiest years of my childhood with him. He um, really was both grandfather and father to me since my own father had been killed in the war. So I sat down to read immediately what this was all about. And I saw that this was a diary that he kept every day in Berlin in 1945. I also noticed that it was written in a way in the form of letters to us. Every entry begins with him expressing his love for us and ends again with more love and also the fervent hope that we were still alive. My grandmother and my mother and myself, a baby, uh, had fled Berlin in February 1945 uh, after our apartment was destroyed by bombs. But Api, as I called him, had stayed behind to serve as doctor. The rest of the diary, I soon saw, saw with a shock, uh, deals with the terrible conditions during the fall of Berlin as the Soviet, uh, three Soviet armies converged on Berlin and finally took over. Let me read you just a couple of things that I read that first night. People die in the streets without there being any way of carrying them anywhere. Dead horses are cut up in the midst of bombardment, the meat eaten almost raw. No way of cooking, no water, no light. God take pity. Towards evening, the sky to the east is a ghastly sea of smoke. This is where the Russians were, the Soviets were approaching. I creep out at 10 o'clock at night to the clinic under whistling grenades and bombs, a wilderness of fire and dust. Behind it, although already high in the sky, the blood red moon. I resolved right then and there that first night that I would translate the diaries and tell Abby's stories. So I took them back with me to South Bend. I had already noticed that first night, but not paid it much attention because I was so overcome by all the horrors I've read about, that um, two letters appeared quite often. They were a P and a G. And now suddenly, as I had more leisure and read more closely, it hit me like a punch to the gut. PG meant Parteigenosse, member of the party. My Beloved Api had been a member of the Nazi party. I remember how I sat there with a pounding heart, unable to move or know what to do. And when I did act, my first motion was to hide the diaries again, just as my mother had done and not even tell my husband. My. It was about two years later, I think, that Mike and I sat at Tozi's, the coffee house in St. Joe, when suddenly and completely unexpectedly, certainly for Mike, but also for me, my secret burst out. I told him all about what I had found. And Mike surprised me, not only then, but in the days and weeks to come, in urging me that now it was even more important to tell the story of the diaries and show how ordinary people get caught in 
a totalitarian regime. I thought about it a lot. It kept me awake at night, but I just couldn't do it. It felt so much like a betrayer. But I did do one thing I hadn't ever done in my life. I started to read about the Nazi period. Historians, memoirs, other diaries, eyewitness accounts, whatever I could lay my hands on. And I was surprised how many historians stressed that these kind of personal documents are absolutely crucial for us to really understand a period of history, a certain time and place. And then simultaneously at the time, I also happened to read another book, which really gave me the final push to write. And I was working on a book on local African American history, and I read Edward Ball's Slaves in the Family. And he tells us how when he told his family that he was going to write about the slaves in his family, they were shocked and angry. And one of them shouted at him, you're going to dig up our grandfather and hang him. Ball says it gave him pause and he thought about it. But in the end, he decided, no, he was not responsible for what his grandfather had done, but he was accountable for it. He needed to write this. So that seemed so similar to my own situation on a wholly different history and different country and, and so on. But it, the whole impetus to write seemed similar for me as well. And so I set out with two goals in mind. First of all, I wanted to give as powerful a view as Api recorded it in his diaries, to really bring that scene to the reader in the most immediate manner, uh, manner I could. Um, Api was working to exhaustion in medical cellars where he could do so little for the wounded and dying. And that frustration really um, helped, contributed in a way to his utter hopelessness at times. Um, they had few medications and not even water after they had drained the last drops from the heaters. And the uh, wounded and uh, dying were simply lying on the cement floor. Light came only from tallow candles and he describes how they carefully saved each fallen, fallen drop to reuse it again so they wouldn't be completely in the dark. At the same time, when he made his way to the clinic, the familiar streets, this was the area he had lived all his life near the Brandenburg Gate and the Reichstag, the familiar streets were completely unrecognizable. They lay buried under mounds and mounds of rubble. He had to climb over those at times. At other times, he would use a, a, a cellar of a building that was gone to make his way, you know, like almost like pioneers. Uh, other emaciated people would also kind of forge paths through all this. And from the bombs and the fires, the entire city was covered in a layer of acrid smoke that made it hard to breathe. Here are a few more images which maybe say more than I can right now. Api was often at the point of collapse. He would say, oh, I am at an end, or the thought of suicide was never far away. But then what kept him going was, I think, partially even writing this diary that really helped him, but also his faith and his hope that there would be a reunion at some point. He, for instance, I came across a passage like, a heart, even if it lies completely in ruins, keeps on hoping and no experience can teach it otherwise. My second goal was to find out why Api had joined the Nazi party. He joined very early, right after Hitler had become chancellor in 1933. I knew a bit about his life. I knew that he was born in a small Prussian town and that he was educated in Berlin and lived 
all his professional life in Berlin. But I was only 12 when he died and I did not ask him enough questions, which of course now I regret very much. So Mike and I, and at times my son Benedict, we went to Berlin to try to find out more about Abi's life. And I was very lucky in several archives, but particularly in the archives of the university, where they had volumes of documents on my grandfather's life. I found out how he um, was accepted. It was a scholarship to the famous, an academy attached to the famous Charité Hospital, which probably was Germany's most famous, and it had a worldwide reputation. And for every semester that he took for free, he had to commit himself to serve one year as military doctor. Since this was 1909, he did not think that much about it and gladly signed up to become part of this Augustus institution. But he graduated in 1914. And so he was immediately sent to the brutal Eastern Front. I also learned through these archives that a few months into his service, he suffered a nervous breakdown and was sent back to the Charité, now as a patient, where just before he had been a student. After the war, he, he then went, was sent back to the war and he served out all of World War I. But after the war, he at last wanted to set up his own practice. Um, and he chose as an area, he chose this area right in the center of Berlin. But it was not an auspicious time to start anything. Immediately after the war, there was a huge, really gargantuan inflation where a loaf of bread cost a trillion dollars and the cart in which you carried all this paper was worth way more than the paper inside it. Um, and there was so much violence and so much chaos. There were, the communists were very strong and they fought the Nazis. There were shootings in the streets, there were assassinations. And the Weimar Republic, Germany's very first democratic institution was powerless to do anything. They were well-intentioned and well-meaning, but they just could not enforce themselves on all the warring parties and all this chaos and all this violence. There were six million unemployed. There was so much anger, particularly at Weimar, for having agreed to the tr Treaty of Versailles, um, where Germany had to cede a large part of its territory and pay huge reparations. And so they were angry that they had agreed to that and they want, you know, people did not want to cooperate with them. And there's a small indication of how weak they were um, on the so-called day of Potsdam, which was in March 1933, when Hitler was inaugurated as chancellor by um, Field Marshal Hindenburg, the commemorative card shows the um, church, uh, the Potsdam church, which was sort of the emblem for uh, everything Prussian. And Field Marshal Hindenburg with the imperial flag, the empire was gone and the emperor was gone, but here is still the imperial flag. And here Adolf Hitler and the swastika. The flag of the Weimar Republic, which was the flag which Germany has now and had been the flag of the idealistic revolutionaries of 1848 who wanted to unite Germany and wanted a Germany that un under one law and with freedom for all, because at this point, before that, Germany was ruled by lots of little dukedoms, fiefdoms, and every ruler was autocratic and could do exactly as he pleased. So into this world stepped Adolf Hitler, and he promised and promised. He promised law and order. He promised peace and stability, not just for Germany, but for the world. And he promised a return to Christian values. In fact, I was surprised reading some of his early speeches that he ended them with, Amen. And Api, I learned, perfectly fit the profile 
of the people who joined at that early time. They were educated professionals, older, veterans of World War I and conservative. In fact, so many people joined the party around that time that Hitler for a while closed entrance because he did not want his party being taken over by these bourgeois intellectuals and educated professionals. In the process of writing, um, two other subjects forced themselves into the book. The first one was very lovely for me. Uh, researching Api and thinking so much about Api brought back a flood of memories. Right from the start when I was in a kinder transport on my way to him and somehow got left behind in a station, at a station, and but with my cardboard sign around my neck, which had my grandfather's name and address, he appeared immediately when he got notice and when he walked in at dawn the next morning. I clung to him and I didn't let go until we were where he was a refugee and lived uh, in, these, in the last two windows on the right of a farmer's cottage. Here I am uh, when the weather was nice, Api took me on the back of his bike when he made house calls to patients. He served both eye patients, but also often as a general practitioner because there were no doctors. You know, there were hardly any men surviving and very few doctors. And I thought about seeing that bike, I thought about how he later ran beside my wobbly bike riding until I, I was steady enough to do it on my own. And I thought about how we each fall, we built a kite. And I remember particular one fall or one particular day, it was sort of windy and blustery and Api came and said, this is the perfect day for, a, for flying our kite. And so we ran in the meadows, Api holding onto the string and suddenly he disappeared. And I came to that spot and looked down and he had fallen into a ditch and he sat there laughing. And I joined him and laughed too. And he was holding onto the string and the kite was flying so high and it was just a wonderful experience. Christmas also was his special time. He would make the marzipan and decorate the tree and uh, it was just magical. It seems to me now certainly, but it did even then seem like a fairy tale life because I had been moved around a lot from Germany to Austria to different relatives. I uh, was in an Ursuline boarding school where I fell ill with scarlet fever. So now having this wonderful home seemed just like magic. Um, on our walks and picnics, Api also taught me to love nature and I was really glad to see that in the diary he could also gain some reassurance or some strength from nature. Of course there really wasn't any nature because it was all grey ruins but there was the sky and the birds and every free moment he had he would go and look at the sky and write down what he saw and it soothed him. And let me just read you one passage of many. The evening descends over the sad hopelessness of fields of rubble stretching for miles and over bent and askew rafters which grin above it ironically. But the little swallows play screaming happily as in my childhood and the small clouds which pass in front of blue islands in the sky still breathe peace and preach God's merciful father's will. The other subject that I could not avoid that just forced themselves into my mind and into the book was much more troubling. I had to deal with German guilt and Arpi's guilt in particular. 
I had found his denazification document. I don't know whether you knew that after the war, the Allies decreed that everyone who had been a member of the Nazi party had to be denazified. For that purpose, they created five categories, chiefly responsible, those were the people who were tried at Nuremberg, incriminated, less incriminated, fellow traveler, and exonerated. When I saw Api's denazification document, I saw that he was in category five, exonerated, or in German, entlasted, which means unburdened. And in a way, that's what I felt a bit. I felt unburdened. But at the same time, I immediately knew that this was not the only answer or too easy an answer. Although I do not believe in collective guilt, I've come to believe that we are all in some measure accountable for what happens in our countries. We all act politically, whether we vote or don't vote, whether we are fervently engaged or completely indifferent. We all take part in the political situation of our time. I also realize that I cannot do this kind of accounting for API or for anybody else. Everybody has to do this on their own and judge for themselves. We all have to do that. But the words of Martin Luther King Jr. kept ringing in my ears. It may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people. So, as you can see, writing this was hard. Api's Berlin diaries made me confront a past I had evaded all my life. As I grew up in post-war Germany in the 1950s, there was a complete silence about the recent past. We did not talk about it at home. It was not mentioned in public. And even in school, where I got an excellent education with nine years of Latin and seven of French and five of English, history classes always stopped with the end of World War I. And as I remember, I certainly didn't, but I don't think any of my friends or anybody in my circle ever questioned the silence. So, now, late in life, I have to come to terms with my German past. I had always been ashamed of being German for its horrendous history of genocide and war, but I had never dealt with the guilt. So now I had to keep asking myself, what would I have done if I had lived in the Third Reich? What small acts of courage or cowardice would I have committed? In a meeting, would I have raised my arm in the Hitler salute along with everyone else? Or would I have had the courage not to? Would I have dared listen to the BBC to get some real news rather than the propaganda and lies that was the only news people had, even though listening could carry a death sentence? How far would I have been willing or able to help Jewish neighbors. Of course, I would like to think that I would have been brave enough to stand up against the Nazis, no matter what the risk. But I really know that I would have been as helpless and felt as powerless and confused as Alpi had done. So this is the impact on me. But more importantly, what is the impact on you, the reader of this book? And for me, there are two main feelings I would love you to come away with. First, I would like you to have a real immediate feeling for the volcanic eruptions that so upset my grandfather's life, who had to serve in World War I and in World War II, who lost his only son, who lost his son-in-law, his practice and all his belongings. And also see how these volcanic eruptions still reverberate with me in the third generation. As a result of 
thinking about this, I hope you will feel more powerfully how the life of each one of us is intersects with and is impacted by history. We all have a past and that past is still with us or as William Faulkner put it so well when he said, the past is never dead, it's not even past. But I hope that the ultimate takeaway is one of empathy. Whenever we hear or we read about somebody's struggles or sufferings, no matter how different they are from us, we are moved, we feel empathy. And this makes us feel how we are all bound together and give us, gives us a new faith in our common humanity and in the power of compassion and tolerance to overcome prejudice and hate. Although much of the diary deals with the torture and violence perpetrated by one human being about, over others, there are also instances where love and compassion can breach the abyss of hate. And even at its, his most desperate, Api could write, if love once again dwells in all human hearts, then also will the life on, God wonder, on God's wonderful earth again become not only bearable, but beautiful. Thank you very much.